Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Monday, January 13th, 2020, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Alright guys, well, we're going to continue going through the quote-unquote giants or large hominids, as I like to call them, state by state, and in this video we're going to cover more accounts of Iowa. And just as in the last video that I did on Iowa, it's just the details in these things are just remarkable. And after you hear them, it leaves you scratching your head because, you know, it just seems so fascinating. It must have been incredible, you know, stumbling upon these things, which is often how it happened. And it's no surprise because... Often the most prime real estate was, you know, where these mound areas were and, you know, where these people lived because they obviously agricultural societies, you know, just, you know, mainstream is finding that out more and more. They're starting to abandon the whole hunter-gatherer thing because you know, it's starting to look like, you know, societies that were agricultural or just more deep into the past than you think so or they thought so in any case you know Iowa is a you know state rich with these uh, archaeological sites these mound areas and mound complexes and also very many effigy mounds which is just so fascinating too but they don't talk about that in these accounts. It's strictly, you know, talking about these large skeletal remains often found by accident and, you know, often by some, you know, people of some credibility. But in any case, Des Moines County, eight-footer, in excavating for a cellar for Governor Grimes' new house at Burlington, Iowa, the workmen came upon an arched vault some 10 feet square which on being opened was found to contain eight human skeletons of gigantic proportions. The wall of the vault was about 14 inches thick, well laid up with cement of an indestructible water. So, right there, it's like 14 inches thick. Wow! I mean, you know, who knows what that thing must have weighed and, you know, was it a cut stone? It doesn't go into the details here, but... That would be interesting to know, but well laid up with cement of an indestructible mortar. What? Indestructible mortar? Where are they getting indestructible mortar from? I bet you they weren't getting it from Home Depot. Okay? You weren't getting it in there anyway. They just, they, Home Depot sells like hydraulic cement, but in buckets, but, it, you know, vault grade concrete, you gotta pay a premium for that. Maybe it's the Romans gave it to him. I mean, you know, 5,000 years, uh, 5,000 B.C., Windover Bog people seem to, all, seem to be Europeans over there. Came, probably came over here for a visit. Got shipwrecked. The vault is about six feet from the base to the arch. The skeletons are in a state of preservation. And the Burlington paper says are the largest human remains ever found, being a little over eight feet long. Vermont, Phoenix, May 2nd, 1857. So, you know, Governor Grimes, you know, dug up a cellar there and found this vaulted 10-foot square tomb with eight human skeletons and with indestructible water that they got from Home Depot. And, wow, man. That's pretty neat, but I'm sure Governor Grimes had to have his cellar dug, and he couldn't, he couldn't waste time with all this stuff. So I bet you they just threw it on his side or whatever it is, <laughs> I'm sure. Or they disappeared. Some guys came by from the Smithsonian and put him in uh, hefty bags and carted them off. Giants from Iowa Mounds, El Paso Herald. This article is very difficult to read, but I'll, I'll try to do my best. The most remarkable assemblage of prehistoric mounds in the United States, both in number and size, is the famous Cahokia group opposite St. Louis in Illinois. 
Many such tumuli contain thousands of skulls showing that they were used for burial purposes. In an Iowa mound was found the skeleton of a giant who must have been six inches over seven feet in height. Around his neck was a collar of bear's teeth. A skull from a mound in Alabama was entirely filled with the small with small snail shells. The puzzle is to imagine why. In another mound, the government experts came across a large central chamber in which were 11 skeletons arranged in a circle with their backs against the walls, while in their midst was a great seashell which had been converted into a drinking cup. So, how curious is that? And I bet you the guy with the collar of bear's teeth, how much you want to bet that that guy had to kill that bear with just like a knife or something like that? I bet you. I bet you that guy killed it like a bear with just a knife or whatever, you know, just kind of things that, you know, re recounted in, you know, native histories and what, you know, myths and legends and all that kind of stuff. But maybe it's true, you know, you got a big guy, you just, you know, go up and, you know, wrestle a bear or whatever it is with just a knife and kill him or whatever. That's pretty savage, man. I wouldn't do that. A bear's a mighty strong creature, man. Even the ones we got now, plenty strong, real strong. They don't have the veil like we do. Animals don't have the veil. The farmer in Bellinger County, while plowing over a mound, struck a stone coffin containing a skeleton and a gourd-shaped vessel filled with lead ore, so pure that he turned it into bullets. Ah, oh, wasn't that good of him? It's practical. It was not uncommon for the builders of such tumuli to inter their dead in coffins of this kind. Cysts, that is to say, walled with slabs of stone. Some of the mounds held caches filled with corn. The caches filled with corn, well, that's a good indication that they're an agricultural society, I would assume. But, you know, they're like hunter-gatherers, we well, got to stick to that. Because we don't know what we're talking about. Filled with corn, evidently many centuries old, in one near Chillicothe was dug up a hollow metal something with many perforations. Is it, it, Its use is a mystery, but probably it had some magical significance and belonged to a prehistoric medicine man. The famous Hope Man in Florida yielded copper breastplates set with pearls, and in other mounds in the same state, the excavators came across copper snakes of highly artistic workmanship. Not snakes, not the serpent again and again and again and again and again. So, that was just very odd. Copper, um, whatever it was, with perforations, what's that, you know, and, you know, Cis slabs with stone, very odd, gourd-shaped vessel filled with lead, El Paso Herald 1912, so 20th century, and this, you know, the lead, what could they be using it for? I wonder, do you keep hearing about lead again and again, well, obviously they knew about it, Seven feet eight with copper implements, a nut for the archaeologists. Since the result of Governor Arney's explorations in New Mexico was made public, there has been no discovery of more interest to the American archaeologists than the one alleged to have been made by made recently in Iowa on the line of a projected Dubuque and Minnesota Railroad. The workmen, while engaged in excavation, excavating for the road in the limestone at the foot of, the, of a block, are said to have come upon a flat stone covered with strange characters. 
strange characters again. This being removed opened the way into a passage about four feet wide and six feet high, leading directly into the heart of the bluff. At the, at a di at the distance of about 50 feet from the entrance, another stone similar to the first had to be removed when a large chamber revealed itself cut out of the solid rock about 25 feet square and 20 feet high. The floor was hard and smooth, while the walls and roof were carved in a sort of rude basso relivio, with figures of birds, trees, stars, serpents, and chariots. The south wall was adorned with, quote, a, with a representation, representation of, of the sun, and immediately below this figure of a man in the act of stepping out of a boat and holding in his hand a dove. So far, the revelations were not very different from many previous ones in similar caves and rock chambers throughout our western country, but the most curious part of discovery was yet to come, and one that would go far to support the theory of many savants with regard to the physical degeneration of the race, a flat slab in the floor of the cavern being raised revealed below a vault filled with skeletons of unusual size, the largest being seven feet eight inches high by actual measurement. By the side of each skeleton was, a set, uh, was set a small vase filled with yellow earth, beneath which could yellow ochre beneath which were found animal bones and particles of animal matter. The skeletons were placed in a semicircle toward the southwest. And we've heard of them buried, you know, with the facing to the east, all these different positions, it must mean something. Who this lost and unknown race of giants can have been, we leave it to our antiquarians to conjecture. Perhaps they were a branch of that mysterious and cultivated people whom the Aztecs are said to have swept away and destroyed in their great era to the plains of Mexico, or they may have been related to the great stock of the Natchez, which once held sway along the Mississippi. The figures, figured sun on the walls of the rock chamber would indicate that they worshipped that luminary, and that and the representation of a man with a dove stepping out of a boat may be an allusion to that tradition of the deluge, which in one form or another, all our Aboriginal peoples have been found to hold, but. Whatever family this forgotten race have may have may have belonged, it is certain that they had attained a higher degree of civilization than was reached by those who came after them. In the fingers of the largest skeleton was clasped a pearl ornament, and traces of cloth were found crumbled at the feet of the remains. What is still more important and curious, many copper implements were found, thus seeming to show that the Lake Superior mines had been worked at a very early period. If the accounts we have received on this re remarkable cave are strictly true, investigation may derive from it important additions to our stock of knowledge regarding the primitive races of this continent, and we are glad to know that the remains are to be removed to the Iowa Institute of Arts and Sciences at Dubuque. Never to be seen again. New York Times, 1871. Okay. So... Removed evidently to some institution, and then what? You know, never to be seen or heard of or made sense of or anything, you know. Just, and if people will say, you know, well, you know, what's the big deal? It's always minimized, and it seems to me that people, it's interesting to study this in a more deeper level where there must have been this concerted effort to you know, put an end to the whole giant business and whatnot. And it seems to me that 
it was an extreme effort to do this and you know naturally probably under the direction of the Bureau of Ethnology okay to all educational departments no doubt okay by these jerks like Alice Hurd Lushka and uh, a, you know W.H. Holmes or H.W. Holmes or whatever he was the other guy who was a, some asshole from there too the giants of Floyd County, Iowa, skeletons in Iowa mouths. The people of Floyd County, Iowa, have often speculated as the contents of a group of 40 curious-looking mouths on the farm of John Strimger, but none of them had curiosity enough to investigate until Professor Webster took the work in hand on his own account. So whoever this Professor Webster was, you know, they probably think he's some kook or whatever it is, but... You know, I'm sure he had research, I'm sure he had notes, I'm sure he had, you know, charts and diagrams or whatever became of all this stuff. Picked up by the Smithsonian, no doubt. And, uh, you know, filed under G or, in, you know, in a giant warehouse. The Scrimger Farm lies just north of the pretty village of Charles City and is one of the most beautiful sections of the state. On the eastern part of the farm is a long, low ridge running directly north and south, on top of which are the mounds, some 40 in number, about 3 feet in height and ranging from 15 to 25 feet in length. Thus far, Professor Webster has opened 14 of these mounds and found the skeletons of 30 people. He thinks a different race from any of the prehistoric remains yet unearthed in this country. Just how long the ridge and mass have been there, Mr. Scrimger can't say. Neither can the oldest settler, and neither can the Potawatomi Indian traditions, which run back many centuries. That both ridge and mounds were built by human hands is plain from the mathematical regularity which, with which they are arranged and the hardness of the soil composing them, which is packed firm like a stone, while that of the virgin prairie in the neighborhood is soft and yielding. So it's just very interesting how, you know, these people obviously use tamping of some sort, and maybe with large stone was used as tampers for these things to pack it down as hard as stone. And this guy thinks it's a different race, Okay, but who's to say it's human? So it says built by human hands, just a different race of humans. But who's to say that at all? Just not a different type of humanoid, which some of these things, descriptions of these things is, is seem more like that. The skeletons found by Professor Webster are in various stages of preservation some quite solid and others crumbling to dust, while in one mound there was nothing but a bed of ashes. All the dead had been buried in a double up position, knees being crowded on the lower jaw, and the head of ca of cash carefully laid towards of each carefully laid towards the east, while the femur bones show that most of the skeletons are those of people about five feet seven inches tall, there are four the original owners of which must, must have been fully seven feet tall. Again, demonstrating this dynamic where you have a class of royalty or higher status people, higher class people who are of large stature, and perhaps their subjects who live in this arrangement in their society. This is, this is showing this whole dynamic here. I mean, I just... Repeated again and again, and you know, the actual research is showing this as I went through it in those uh, reports from Indiana. The skulls of those are raised very, of very inferior beings. The tops are abnormally thick, and the frontal bones slope, slope abruptly back from the eyes, while the lower jaws protrude forward so that under teeth come outside of the upper one, so it's like underbite. In general contour, the skulls resemble those of the prehistoric mound builders found in Ohio, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Most of the skeletons found by Professor Webster show marks of 
fire as if the flesh had been burned from the bones before burial. Another strange thing is the entire absence of anything like personal trinkets or implements of war or the chase as are generally found in eastern mounds. The bones of animals showing that the friends of the deceased had celebrated their interment with funeral feasts are also missing. The only thing thus far on earth in the Iron Mounds, aside from the skeletons, is a lot of broken pottery of crude design and make, including one nearly whole vase or urn of archaic workmanship which Professor Wester now has. New York Sun. Okay, I think I have just time for one more, which is kind of funny. Petrified foot, 23 inches long. A petrified foot more than two feet long was found in a coal mine near Lady by miners at Fort Dodge, Iowa. It is perfectly formed and weighs more than 30 pounds. The foot was dislodged by the miners at the 90-foot level of the mine. So, you can only imagine, hey, what you got there? A foot? A foot? What do you mean a foot? I got a foot. Oh, that looks like two feet to me. I mean, where did this uh, dismembered foot come from? And, uh, you know, 90 foot level of a coal mine. And, uh, you know, I heard either it was Velikovsky or William Corliss, or I heard from somewhere else, maybe it was uh, Harry Hubbard, I don't know, but how, you know, it, the way the coal was formed in North America bears a little bit more ex uh, 